All right, today we have Holland Busby and James Rollin presenting Living Tiny Legally. Um, they or save your questions for the end and please give them your undivided attention. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Yeah. Surprisingly, Sorry. Living Tiny Legally is harder than it would seem. Yeah, but uh, what our proposal focused on was implementing a feasibility study to use energy efficient tiny homes to address the issue of affordable housing locally. So what we're going to talk about today is the issues with affordable housing as a whole, looking at the national and local trends, the reasons why you should go tiny, some of the legal challenges you'll face along the way, and then some of our technical recommendations for building energy efficient homes. So this um, graph actually shows the national building trends. From 1973 to 2015, the average house size has increased by approximately 1,000 square feet. Average home construction today builds homes as large as 2,600 square feet. However, the average size of homes that has increased, the average size household size has actually decreased from an average of three people per household to 2.5. This means that there are fewer people living in households while the household size or while the house size is actually growing meaning that house size or house prices are actually increasing as well. Mm -hmm. So in 2008, there was a huge housing crisis where the markets clapped, collapsed, and that essentially sent shockwaves through the market. Uh, after that time, there was a stark drop off in home ownership and a spike in rentals. What this had was a direct correlation to the affordable housing stock where uh, with more people choosing to rent, obviously supply and demand, you don't have enough supply to meet the demand, so you're going to have a tightening, mar a tightening market, increases in prices, and when that happens, typically the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum are going to get squeezed out, and in that case, we have a, we just don't have enough in terms of affordable housing stock. So. So this map depends, or depicts the medium rents within the Harrisonburg area. Um, the tan area actually shows rents that are $700 per month or less, while as the areas get darker, um, the rent cost increases. Um, the tan areas are the most appropriate locations for tiny house development. 80% of uh, renters with incomes less than $15,000 per year face severe cost burdens and this represents 5,000 people in the Harrisonburg metro area. Uh, with the median rent for a one bedroom apartment being 630 a month, uh, there's a severe need for affordable housing in the Harrisonburg area. And in terms of context for defining affordable housing, uh, what we use the uh, HUD or Housing Ur Urban, Urban Development Standard, where if you're spending 30% of your median income or 30% of your income towards housing, then your cost burden, 50% threshold, is a severe cost burden. So, cool. So, what our proposal is, is to use tiny houses to essentially increase the affordable housing stock. But, what are tiny houses? They have a lot of different definitions. So, there's manufactured homes, which are essentially mobile homes. There's modular homes, tiny houses on wheels, foundations. Uh, for the scope of this project, we uh, chose to focus on tiny houses on wheels and tiny houses on foundations. Tiny houses on wheels can be anywhere from 100 to 400 square feet in size, whereas tiny houses on foundations can be anywhere from 500 square feet to 1,000 square feet. So in addition to focusing on tiny houses, our specific niche was focusing on energy efficiency within tiny homes. And why would you do this? And it comes down to money. So if anything, just be greedy. Be energy efficient and you're also gonna save money. So when you're, when you're developing in, uh, affordable housing in an urban context, there's a couple different models that you're gonna use. Uh, what typically goes up is you're looking at some of the high rises uh, where like a 50 apartment complex is a mid rise, 100, 100 apartment complex is a high rise. And then we have a cost comparison in terms of per unit versus a tiny house that was actually built here and comparing that to a tiny house on wheels. Uh, as you can see, they're, in terms of square footage, these are all comparable. You're not, you're not gonna be living in luxury in under 500 square feet. But the most important thing that we are gonna focus on is the energy. 
because if you're in a low income housing, you're already disproportionate in terms of how much money you're paying for your rent, but also in your utilities. For uh, There's a stat from the Harvard, uh, was it the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Survey? and where they found low-income renters are paying approximately 20% of their income towards utilities, whereas if you're making over 75000 a year, you're only paying 5%. So by reducing that utility load and just the, the strict energy cost, you're going to be saving money and having a ripple effect on the costs. So, and then just in terms of your total, like, just in terms of dollars, it's, it's much easier to invest in tiny houses than it would be for a high-rise apartment. So the minimum house size that you can build to code on a foundation is according to the Uniform State Building Code, or the Virginia USBC. Um, the minimum uh, size is actually 120 square feet. Now the 2015 um, IBC minimum standard, which is International Building Code, um, actually says that it's 88 square feet but Virginia has yet to adopt the 2015 IBC code. Um, they will be coming out with their adoption or non-adoption in 2018. So we will see if it actually can be 88 square feet in Virginia. We'll find out. That's on, that's on Richmond. Yes. <laughs> so, so, but with those being houses on foundations, now we're going to hit on tiny houses on wheels. Now, Tiny Houses on Wheels, these are the fads that you guys see. I'm sure you've watched the HGTV shows and everything like that, and this is what always pops up in the news. But common misconception, Tiny Houses on Wheels, they're not actually houses. They're, in terms of legal definitions, they are RVs. So <laughs> just because they're, they're mobile, and not, mobile not on a foundation, and they're actually under a different registry. Uh, the issue with tiny houses on wheels is the fact that they, there's no building codes that regulate what you can do with that. Since they are recreational vehicles, they're registered under the Department of Transportation. And the only laws that you need to adhere to with these are the dimensional requirements that make it street legal, where you're under eight and a half feet wide, uh, 13 and a half feet tall, and a maximum trailer length of 40 feet long. And in Virginia, you do have weight requirements that are proportionate to the amount of axles on the trailer, typically two to three. But a two axle, you have a uh, 30,000 pound max. Although 40 feet for a tiny house is excessive, typically tiny houses that you'll see from manufacturers range from 20 to 28 feet in length. But there is good news. So back in 2016, there was a group of tiny house activists that petitioned the IBC which uh, the International Building Code, in terms of developing standards and a classification for tiny houses. So, and they successfully petitioned the IBC and in December actually got an appendix approved for the 2018 IBC that <coughs> specifically addresses building standards for tiny houses. Uh, a couple, and they, for the most part, they are fairly consistent with standard construction codes with minor details for like spacing requirements, ceiling heights, and like egress windows. But uh, all the other ones were covered by ANS uh, ANSI, American National Standards Institute, uh, 119.5, which is the industry RV code. So, but unfortunately, that's not going to come out until 2018. So you're still stuck with the issue today of where do you park your home? <laughs> and that's and that's the issue. So, and the thing is, it depends on where you live, because current and currently in Harrisonburg, you can't do that. You can't live in one of these. So, but and but some municipalities have passed specific ordinances banning RV living. Oh, and though some have also hopped on the tiny house movement and use that to, as a draw just to get people into their towns. Like one instance is a place, uh, Spur, Texas, where they openly accepted all tiny houses on wheels. Their proclamation was come here, pop off the wheels, attach to utilities, you're golden. Uh, and that was one change to a law. Another one out in Fresno, California, they allowed for tiny houses to be used as an ADU or accessory dwelling unit. So you have this on your property, and you have a house existing on your property, and then you have some land in the backyard. You can pop a tiny house there, connect it to the house. Someone could live in there full time, perfectly legal, as long as you have dual inhabitants. And then 
the most, uh, probably the most common one is to, to do tiny houses in a community setting. And that was done in Rockledge, Florida, where they went through the zoning board and did what was it called an overlay district, where they petitioned, sent out a master plan community, which their design included, well, tiny houses. And they did have some provisions in terms of what your building structures are gonna look like and the amount of wheels versus foundations, but they got approved for legal permanent residencies. So, but the biggest issue facing tiny houses going forward is zoning. Right, so as James was saying, um, zoning is kind of the biggest barrier against where to park your tiny home. Well, a tiny home needs a manufactured housing uh, zoning ordinance. This is um, the, a representation of the zoning laws in Harrisonburg. It's a little blown up, but we did do an overlay of um, the areas that were in the previous map that were the tan areas where the rents were much lower, 700 a month or lower. And so these would be uh, perfect locations uh, for tiny house affordable, or affordable housing development. And the importance of zoning is because they regulate um, by clustering like communities together and facilitate the use of the land mm -hmm. in a very efficient way. Yeah, essentially. And so this case study was in Eugene, Oregon, and it was called Opportunity Village and is still um, going on today. And it was designed to serve as transitional housing um, for, to alleviate homelessness. And the village consists of 30 units, um, each of them ranging from 60 to 80 square feet. So that's really tiny. And um, they each, each of the residents have shared community resources such as um, kitchen, bathroom, and laundry. Um, they benefit from this because they are super cheap to build. Each cost about 2,000 to construct and they can come up very quickly. So this was perfect for the solution to homelessness. Now, while it's perfect for homelessness, it's not suitable for single families. It's only or beneficial for single uh, residents or couples that are homeless and they go through screening processes to be able to live here. But it's not ideal for a single family solution. Mm -hmm. So, and conveniently, right down the road, they had another uh, tiny house community in Eugene, except this one was called Emerald Village. These, this was a slightly different model, where instead of addressing transitional housing, this looked to seek to only provide for low income housing stock. Uh, essentially what they had is they leased land from the city and essentially built like a subdivision with all these designated plots in terms of what tiny houses are gonna look like. Each one had a maximum square footage of 250 square feet and they sent out basically submissions to local architects and the university. It's like, here's a plot of land, this is your location, uh, build me a house for under 15K. And as you can see, there's a very wide range in a lot of designs that were implemented. So uh, some of the main features of this, as opposed to Opportunity Village, is the fact that since it is providing for low income housing stock, they do have a rent that they do charge all residents. But they set this price at 300 a month, which is uh, half of what you're looking at for low income. So someone working a minimum wage job full time could still afford this. And the fact that since they are bigger units, they also have a fully functioning kitchen, bathroom, and essentially each unit is self-contained without community resources. However, the downside to this is that your upfront cost is significantly more. And for that reason, they are essentially still under construction and in the process of obtaining funds through primarily grants and donations. So, um, but although these are great case studies in terms of what has been done, we want to focus on the Harrisonburg issue. And unfortunately, there's no, and where the low income housing currently is, we could, there was not land that we could uh, develop today without going through serious rezoning. So, our model, uh, which is essentially a single unit that can be placed on like a, basically any, any residential district, as it is a fully functioning single family home, and if 
do you guys want to build one after? Just talk to us. But like, yeah. <laughs> so, but this could be implemented today. So this uh, structure is approximately 750 square feet with both floors. Um, the second floor is a lofted bedroom and it has a closet as well. Um, but this design is optimal to meet the <coughs> energy uh, demands of a single family with full amenities such as the kitchen, bathroom, and bedrooms. And um, these technologies that we are going to discuss were uh, chosen to design or to meet residential energy demand um, because according to the EIA, um, space heating, water cooling, and space cooling comprise two thirds of the residential energy demand. So it's really important to make those kinds of appliances and structures very, very efficient so that you can reduce costs and reduce your carbon footprint. Um, yes. And then so the trade-off that we had to make as far as our recommended layout was between being cost effective because it is affordable housing, but then also as energy efficient as you can possibly make it. Energy efficient is not always cheap. So that was why some of our design considerations may be less efficient than others, and then that's why we chose certain ones over others. So the, the number one thing that you can do that actually doesn't cost much money is a passive solar design. I don't know if you guys noticed on the previous slide, but all of the windows on the house were south facing, except for one on the east side and west side and none on the north. This is a deliberate design consideration uh, because passive solar is essentially a way that you design a house where you're maximizing the seasonal variation in solar energy. Um, unfortunately though, it's all contingent on location. So in Virginia, at Harrisonburg, we're approximately 38 degrees latitude. This graph is for 40, so that works. But, uh, so essentially how it works is like during the summer, you have cooling as your number one need. And during the summer, the sun is much higher in the sky. So what you want to establish is an overhang that is going to block sunlight from coming through and basically cool your house that way. In the winter, the opposite problem. Heating is your primary concern, but the sun is also lower in the sky. So the length of the overhang is proportionate to latitude, and there's ways to calculate that using solar geometry, where you can maximize the amount of light going into your house at certain points of the year. However, just because getting light in doesn't mean it's gonna it doesn't mean it's gonna stay anywhere. So therefore, you need a place to put it. And where that comes in is thermal mass. In our in our design, we used a uh, concrete floor as our thermal mass. But you can also use like a brick or a stone. But essentially, what that acts is as a giant heat sink, where when the solar radiation is coming through, it gets absorbed and stored in that huge thermal mass during the day, and then when the sun basically just is gone at night, it radiates out through the house, keeping a fairly constant internal air temperature. In addition to that is the window selection, where we went with uh, double pane windows with an argon gas in between. Single pane is incredibly energy inefficient, and the losses are astronomical. And the double pane with the extra pane of glass along with the gas inside significantly increases the R value. The cost difference between double versus like triple pane, the cost difference versus the performance benefit was not a good, that was not a good ROI, so we just went with a single double glazed, and along with a low emissivity. Uh, the low emissivity is a selective coating that you do put on the window that works the same thing with optimizing your solar radiation. We're letting more light in during the winter and blocking it during the summer. So here are some other energy areas that we wanted to make more efficient. Um, to begin, um, advanced framing, stick frame, this will reduce the lumber requirement to build the home and then also reduce the embodied energy of the lumber. And by using ladder framing to brace uh, the pieces together, this also helps with thermal bridging in the walls. And that thermal bridging is essentially uh, whenever heat can escape through the lumber where you want more insulation in between the lumber. Yeah. That, therefore, it makes it much more efficient. Yeah, because the R value of a 2x6 versus your insulation is 
it's very significant. Yes, and then um, if the insulation is done right, uh, it's one of the most practical ways to make um, a home efficient and reduce con condensation and your electric bills by up to 40%. So that's a lot. Um, and 90% of homes in the U.S. now use fiberglass insulation, which is less environmentally friendly, and so our recommendation was cellulose which is essentially the same R value rating per square foot um, with six inches of cellulose combined with the two inches of rigid foam um, insulation can combined together can give you an R value of 22. This is well over the minimum uh, building standard, which is R13. Um, and then, so the thermal storage properties, the sound insulation, and the fact that cellulose is 75 to 85% uh, recycled paper makes it a really good choice for this kind of home. And then also for the roof, we recommend asphalt shingles with R38 spray foam insulation underneath um, the exterior so that we can meet the minimum code requirement, which is R38. And in addition to just having your asphalt shingle roof, shingle roof we're going to put a solar PV panel on top based on dimensional requirements and estimated spatial and energy needs for the house, we approximate about a four kilowatt system would meet the energy demands of this home. Um, in addition, since it is like a four kilowatt system, we would use a process called net metering, where essentially you get a second meter on your uh, electrical meter. And, any, and the energy surplus that you produce goes directly back into the grid and you would get a tax credit for that or you, you know you get energy you get an energy credit for that so and that way and that solves the biggest issue surrounding solar today which is storage uh, because you can produce all the energy you want but it's only it's a one-to-one -one ratio between production and use and those demands don't match up so with the PV system you will meet your electrical needs uh, net metering your RN net metering, you will have energy credits, and that will reduce the utility bill significantly. Essentially, it could drop to zero on a sunny day, which it has been one of the biggest issues with low income housing. In addition to our PV system, we are gonna use a tankless hot water heater with a point of source heating element. This was uh, selected over like a solar thermal in terms of, one, ease of use, just because it's a tiny house, you don't have that much space. And if you're gonna put an entire hot water tank, there's not much, there's not much space for an entire hot water tank. So the tankless version, all electric, with your energy needs already met, and that will essentially cover that. And the nice part about like installing solar now is we're still under the federal tax credit, where we have not until 2021, where you know, there's a 30% uh, subsidy for new solar installations. And for putting on a system like this, your payback period would be roughly 22 years from installation. And so HVAC, or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, um, indoor air quality is especially important, <coughs> especially in tiny homes. You have a lot less room, so air ventilation, and in a very tight home, like we're describing with the insulation, that is very, very important to have good uh, air ventilation. So we recommend buying a small and cheap air source um, a heat pump to replace both the furnace and AC central air unit um, for a small home. Uh, paired with an ERV or an energy recovery ventilator, uh, which dehumidifies and pre-cools in the warm months and then it humidifies and preheats in the cooler months. Um, while that does provide some dehumidifying properties, you still need a dehumidifier. Um, it does not do, the ERV does not do all the dehumidifying you need, especially in Virginia's climate. Um, so we do recommend also getting uh, a ventilating dehumidifier. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the issues with uh, building green like this, is you insulate the house so well, circulating air through doesn't work because if you're building like a code min house you already have all these air gaps that work as natural air circulation but building a house tight air quality becomes a major issue so uh, the other and so we found that these uh, recommended technologies offered the most return on investment in a small scale house um, there are other many very exceptional uh, green technologies uh, such as solar thermal water heating um, geothermal ground source, 
um, gray water and so many other steps towards environmentally friendly uh, structures that you can implement in your home. Um, but we, as we said, we had to kind of find a good balance between cost effectiveness and energy efficiency, especially since it is for uh, low income homes. Cool. So in conclusion, our recommendation of utilizing energy efficient uh, single family tiny homes will essentially increase the affordable housing stock within the Harrisonburg area. So, and then a uh, little bit closing remarks. Um, we would like to thank Dr. Stephen Freisinger and Dr. Charles Hendrick, or Mr. Charles Hendricks. Um, they both worked so hard with us and were very patient and helped us a lot with um, a lot of the uh, information that we needed. So. So, uh, any any questions, uh, Joel? Yes. Um, so, we're talking about the cellulose. Um, <coughs> cellulose versus like, yeah. Um, would that be flammable? Because that is an issue with a lot of sustainable installations that they can become very flammable. So is there a way or a version to do that sustainable and non-flammable that you guys found, or is that um, still in search? Part partially, one of those is um, what the. That's where the trade-off is because yes, it is flam it, it is flammable, but you can use some flame retardants. But they're also the flame retardants are unsustainable. Right. So yeah, you're being like unsustainable to be sustainable. So it's like take your pick. Yeah, so just be careful in the be, house. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. But the, actually, the biggest issue with cellulose is the fact is the um, leakage because once it gets wet, unlike uh, fiberglass, it drastically reduces its insulating properties. So, and that's definitely one of the trade-offs, but it's, again, it's like, it's newspaper. Yeah, so doing dry cellulose insulation, um, you do have the effect of where it starts to fall, and then so when you're losing insulation towards the top. And so there are ways to very, like, densely compact the insulation, and that doesn't really help with um, flammability, but um, there are other ways, such as like spray foam, uh, cellulose and yeah. just many other types of cellulose yeah. that some may be better than yeah. others as far as flammability. Yeah, and that's saying a lot of fossil fuel based a lot of fossil fuel based technologies are watertight because oil repels <laughs> water. So, <laughs> but uh, but yes, I've bad experience with heat pumps. Yes, what about Peltier panels and just hundred watt incandescent bulbs for in place of a heat pump? In place of a heat pump. Um, if your house is probably like 200 square feet, incandescent bulbs versus like an LED. Uh, actually, one thing, lighting was not a particularly big energy drain. No, 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 oh. I meant for heating. Oh, for, yeah, you, yeah, incandescent bulbs, yeah, incandescent bulbs are, they give off a lot of heat, as opposed to like LED or CFLs that you use today. Um, however, we would, enter the electricity towards lighting, we just would use LEDs straight up because the payback period on that is gonna reduce those energy loads. And for a house that's probably about 700 or so square feet with only R22, <coughs> we actually, we don't have the cost as the cost estimates. However, I don't, I, that would work for like a passive house with like 11 inch thick ICF walls and 200 square feet. So it depends on scale. Yeah, it does. And Peltier panels? Uh, Peltier panels. I'm um, actually not familiar with those. Is it where you apply current to them and one side gets cold, the other side gets hot? And people you often use those in automobiles to cool down automobiles in place of, you know, they augment the, uh, the air conditioning. The air conditioning helps mm -hmm. the driver, but often there are, say, passengers in the back that yeah. need cooling. So put, because it's a small enclosed space, yeah. the Peltier panel in the back it cools the people in the back. Yeah, it's really definitely worth future consideration. Thank yeah. you. Where does this panel get placed in the back? Is it on the window? Oh, okay. Cool. Um, yes. Do you guys have cost estimates for your uh, plan? Yeah. Um, yeah, for this house, the house that we're proposing to build, not including land acquisition, the cost would be about 100000 roughly. So, which is, it's not horrible. So again, some of the tiny houses that we did see, uh, did show were, again, like they were designed specifically for 15K. But they also again they got that land for free, and they all and one thing that one thing that those um, case studies did promote was the fact that t 
tiny houses and especially for low income, they work best when they're developed within communities. So you can't, so building a single unit, it does work and it does address the stock, but communities are generally more sustainable as you have like a network in place, you have more accountability, people in the same boat and things like that. The nice thing about this, un about this unit though is the scalability. If you only have $100,000 today, you can build this house now, and then you're not waiting on grants to build an entire development all at once in one shot. And how does that match up with the affordability for low-income communities, that, that $100,000 price? I don't know how that can uh, That's a little, prices. that's higher, because if you're gonna build, if you're gonna build just a code min house, uh, probably about the same size, you'd be looking maybe like two-thirds of that cost. So. Uh, so ours, we estimated probably about 140, 145-ish a square foot, uh, but that number, the numbers that we have are the pay, the reason we do that, the, we invest up front is because the energy efficiency with like the PV and the reduced heating and cooling loads, over the lifespan of the house, you're going to recoup that money <coughs> plus more and also probably have a higher quality of life, so. Uh, any other questions?